Hello guys, my name is Lars Dinder. I'm a writer from Denmark who specializes in science fiction and fantasy stories. I'm here today to read from my fantasy novel Mandigo and the Hellhounds. And um, if you want to know more about my books and my works, just follow the links at the bottom of the screen. Mandigo and the Hellhounds, chapter 31. Mendigo had just had enough time to hide his new sword out of Gorgas' smithy before Matera ordered him to meet him in the library. Mendigo was well aware of the fact that he was about to get the greatest scolding of his life, but he was still completely unprepared for what awaited him when he stepped through the door. He was slammed up against the nearest wall, and a blow from the rock dumbed him before he had a chance to react. Matera's dark gift pierced through his spread hands, arms and legs like blazing pins, and nailed him to the wall like a hanging sculpture, and he was practically choking. How dare you! Mortero screamed angrily into Mandigo's face. How dare you disobey me in this way? How dare you disregard all my rules and jeopardize lives here at the fortress? Do you have any idea of what you've done, you ungrateful wretch? Mandigo began to get a sense of the severity of his crime, as the pain he was experiencing from Mortero's magic made him grimace. They take Motero and the other wizards, including the initiates, the rest of the entire night and most of the following day to restore peace and order at the fortress. Most of the escaped ghosts had either gone over to the other side on their own accord or they had been driven out of Bloodstone. A few had been chased into the crypt and the big seal that kept them imprisoned down there had been restored. But the price had been great, in effect too great. Mendigo realized now. Over twenty dracoids and servants had lost their lives during the mayhem, caused by the revengeful spirits, and nearly three times as many had been injured. The infirmary was packed, and the wounded had to lie in the hallways and corridors of the temporary tents out in the inner courtyard. The whole place was an awful mess, and the air was still thick with smoke from the fires that led to extensive damage of the fortresses adjoining buildings and workshops. Your shortlessness and irresponsibility could have ended the catastrophe, you idiot! Both you and your friends could have been killed, Mortero roared accusingly. He is right, Mendigo thought to himself. He would never be able to forgive himself for the pain and torment that Jasper, Helena and Caspar had had to endure because of his wish to break into the crypts. He had been thinking about his friends all day. Did you even once pause to consider for a brief moment just why there might be such a powerful seal above the crypt before you decide to break in? Mortero queried incredulously. His whole body seemed to tremble in his attempt to control his anger. I thought I thought you had become more of an adult, Mendigo. I thought I could trust you. Instead, you were acting like a, a crazy wild man and a snub nosed hillbilly as soon as I am away for just a few weeks. Do you have any idea how disappointed I am in you? It's going to take weeks, months, years to restore the damage you have caused just because you weren't able to control your curiosity of the gift. An expression of sadness and loathing came over Mortero's face and he turned away. His gift released its hold on Mandigo, who slid down the wall in Mortero's study, like a picture whose string had broken. He had been close to fainting partially due to pain and partially due to lack of oxygen. And he landed heavily on the floor with where he collapsed, collapsed in a moaning and rattling bundle. And then he threw up. Mortero sighed deeply. But perhaps it's partially my own fault, he said, addressing mostly himself. I should have taken better care of you from the beginning. You're not like the other students here at Bloodstone. I realize that now. Then he spun around towards Mandigo, who in the meantime had got on all fours, coughing and spitting. Why did you have to insist on going down to that crypt? Mandigo slowly came to his knees. He dried his mouth with his sleeve before speaking. Why, why didn't you tell me that Helena and Grimald are my siblings? Mortero gawked at him. Who told you that? My mother, the white lady, Mandigo replied, with tightly shut eyes as he tried to steady himself. Mortero cursed and held up his arms despairingly. 
Don't you know that you can never trust the words of a restless spirit he hissed and turned away from it? But it's true, isn't it? Mendigo said. The stench from his own vomit stung his nostrils and he struggled to get to his feet. And the knight in the cellar, he's the Duke of Argin, and he didn't murder my father. He is my father, my real father. Astero Nordering, isn't he? Botero looked like he had just swallowed a rotten piece of fruit. For a moment it looked as though he might lash out at something, anything, in order to break it to pieces. But then he let out a long, ragged sigh, let his arm fall loosely to his sides. Helena Grimald are your brother and sister, he admitted, finally admitted in a low voice. He turned halfway around to Wasman Digo and scowled tiredly at him. I concealed it from you for your own sake, Mendigo. For my own sake, Mendigo repeated doubtfully. Matero nodded. Do you remember that I once told you that there were some noblemen who were envious of your father's success and wanted to kill him? Yes, I do, Mendigo replied. But you also told me that they had been led by the Duke of Argen and that they had ambushed my father. But it was the Duke who had been ambushed, right? And the Duke was my father. Montero nodded again, heavily, slowly. Yes, Mendigo, you are the Duke of Argen's youngest son. As I told you, you were a baby when I took you in and brought you to safety at the Miller's house in Oak Hill. And that is the very reason why I didn't tell you. You didn't remember it yourself, but what's more important, your father's murderers knew nothing about you. They knew about Grimald and Helena. Several of them have even met the two of them at parties or other engagements at your parents' castle, right up to the time of the ambush and murder of your father. But they knew nothing about you, and I hope it stays that way. That is the only way that I can protect you. It's hard enough for me to protect Grimald and Helena. Your father's murderers are constantly looking to kill your siblings, Mortero said, as he held up his fist. Then he suddenly spread his arms out as though he were about to embrace his entire domain. That's why we are surrounded by all these dracoids. You won't find better or more loyal soldiers. They may be stupid and primitive, but each dracoid fights with a force of three ordinary soldiers, and they never ask any questions. They are loyal to me, and they would give their lives to protect me. And you, free, of course. Mendigo stared at him, not entirely convinced. But why did you start off by saying that the Duke of Argen was my father's murderer? Because you might end up revealing yourself if I had told you the truth. However, if you thought that the Duke was your sole enemy, your whole attitude and all your actions would point away from your true identity. But I would have discovered the truth sooner or later, if nothing else I'd have found out when I'd go out to take the re revenge for my father, Mendigo pointed out. Probably. But by that time you would have been finished with your training as a wizard and therefore better able to protect yourself. I'm not learning anything here, Mendigo protested. Mortero lift an eyebrow. That's your own fault from what I understand. I feel trapped here at the fortress. So instead of coming to me, you break into my crypt and unleash a host of angry spirits. You lied to me. What would you have done? Mortero's expression became dark and more threatening. The shadows in the corner of the room seemed all at once to be reaching up towards Mendigo, whose breath suddenly became visible because the temperature had fallen drastically. I think you better watch what you are saying, kid. Mortero growled. I may have lied to protect you against your father's murderers, but you also have been lying to me, Mendigo. What, what do you mean? Mendigo fumbled as he felt himself getting cornered by the darkness from all sides. The little girl who lived with Greta while you started with her. The girl you found, Mendigo. Because you did find her, didn't you? Mendigo could feel Mateo's power pressing against his chest, but he remained standing in the same spot. Magdan's words were engraved in his mind as they had been written with volcanic fire. And when the Dark One comes, 
we must protect her name. End of chapter. So, why does he know that? Do, 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 do. What has he been doing? So, again, big, big fight. You really like it the same as me. You like to put in a lot of action yeah. in a short amount of time. Yeah. So, even as I need to put a lot of story in, you like the way I write because you see a lot of boom. Yeah. So you definitely like that. Like, like, I like this, this, you know, this amount of energy mm. in this constricted space. Yeah. And just to see what happens. Mm. All that. Yeah. Power. Yes. We like power. Yes. We don't have it in real life, so we take it in books. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> There's two little fists in the bottle of Coke. You know? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Cheers, man. Cheers, man. So, we had the pleasure of having you for dinner tonight. Yes, thank you very much. That's always a pleasure. But I also know that if we don't tell you what to buy, you buy something else. Yeah. So, as we I'm are... I'm a self-help man. I'm not <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know that. So, as we are actually trying not to over-sugar ourselves. Yeah. So, that's sugar-free. Yeah. Just people need to ask. Yes. Um, in theory. Yeah. In theory. Exactly. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Not working. <laughs> <laughs> Stomach grow. <Yes. laughs> Nose. Uh, um, so we had some new fame for dinner tonight. Yeah. I don't know if you ever tried it. I never tasted that before. Um, I tried that before. It was a lovely dish. You actually liked it? Yes. It was, I, I did. What's wrong with you? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe because it's Monday. You know, <laughs> I think, I think actually, I think it's the first Monday I've been here to visit you and, and yeah. read from, from my book. Yeah. It's the first Monday. So it, it, uh, everything can happen. But yeah. I mean, I'm, I, I have this relationship with Mondays, like a Garfield. Um, it's better to wait to yeah. Tuesday. Yes. Uh, <laughs> why, 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 do, why do they have to be there? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I actually changed my mind about Mondays a long time ago. Okay. Um, I changed my mind about it because Everyone hates Monday. Yeah. So I, I need to like it. Yeah. And how I see it now is that Friday is actually the worst day. Yeah. If you like your job, mm. Friday is the worst day. Yeah, because we have to leave the job behind. Exactly. Yeah. When you come on Monday, you finally see all your yes. co-workers again. Yeah. You have new energy. Yeah. And you actually have a good amount of time to talk with them and get this paper And then going. you switch on your computer and everything goes haywire. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so... In, 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 in a way, if you like your job, yeah. then Monday is a good day. Yeah. yeah. If you hate your job, it's Monday is shit. It's, yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's the same with rain. I, I love rain. I, me too. Yeah. yeah. The, the reason why I like it yeah. is I normally sweat a lot. Mm -hmm. So the hotter it is, yes. the worse it gets for me. Yeah. So being outside in rain, rain. Yeah. yeah, being outside in rain makes everything feel fresh. Which is, why, which is why when I work in the bank, uh, I had to wear a, a necktie. It was sheer hell, man. It was especially in, in, in the summer, of course. Yeah. Uh, 30 degrees uh, Celsius and uh, a necktie. <laughs> and no cool wind. Exactly. No that is wind. terrible. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. yeah. that's my, my vision of the but world I'm yeah. trying to change. And you're right. I mean, um, the Mondays should be uh, nice days. Um, they, they should be welcome days. Hmm. Um, I think... The problem is the idiots that been there all the weekend. Yeah, exactly. They, they leave you, you have the feeling that you can come back then in, uh, on Mondays that the all, the idiot, all the idiots, they've been working hard all weekend yeah. uh, just to make things uh, worse. worse for you <laughs> and when you start Monday. I mean, it's, it's just... The scabs. I mean, it's just... just, just they work seven hours, uh, seven days a week, and, and, and you, as a, as a decent guy, you try to try to be decent. You you work your five days, and that's that's really that's enough. But the, the scamps they keep working seven days a week just to make things difficult for you. Yeah. I mean that's unfair. It's it's a, it's a competition you can't you can't beat. And they come back to haunt you and bite you in the ass every Monday morning, and I, I stand there. Before the screen of my computer or my colleague worker, and he says, "Hello, Lars. Just listen. You, you know we've got this problem." <laughs> he starts like, "Hey, Lars. Hey, come and get this nice, hot, warm cup of coffee and 
and and the muffin. You do is just to start this lovely new week. No, last. Hey, this Monday morning, I got this problem. <laughs> David, <laughs> David, man, could you wait until I had my coffee? And it's always like, hey, Lars, everything is fine. Yeah. What? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think maybe they don't do that because uh, they're afraid of how I might react. Yeah. <laughs> we, we need to come up with a problem. Yes, what's yes, the problem? Yes, what's the problem? <laughs> don't find a problem! Anything! <laughs> just a problem! <laughs> Throw it in his face! <laughs> and he knows it is Monday and this thing is alright. <laughs> it's kind of the same uh, with one of my guys here. Yep. Uh, he's called Wardox. Okay. I call him uh, Big D or D Dog or whatever. Yep. And um, we have this uh, ping pong. Yep. I always piss him off. Okay. And he always tried to be an ass. Yeah. But in the end, he's a dog, so get on all four. Yeah. It's not my problem. No. <laughs> Just listen, dog. And uh, he says that if I'm not rude to him, he's no. not sure I'm in, I'm, I will be there. No. <laughs> <laughs> so we have this ping pong and he knows it. Yeah. Um, so I come into a game and I say hello. Mm. Oh, no, it's you, he says. Yes. <laughs> So I get the feeling. And, and immediately, immediately you, have, you have this rapport, you know, <laughs> with this guy. <laughs> we are going down and get road again. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. Um, I think we should uh, cut it off now. Yeah. Um, 